welcome. Uh, my name is Dave Herman. I'm the instructor for the students that are here for this course. And so I have to get a, a few uh, housekeeping things done because we also broadcast uh, over the satellite system. So for the RCD students, um, we had a little problem in the recordings this week. So we'll make an extension for last week's recordings so you can get your write-ups in there through next week. Okay. And uh, for those of you here in class, we appreciate it. And for our uh, guests that are here, we appreciate you coming. Very excited uh, with the speakers that we have tonight. Um, I asked uh, Mike Glauser, Dr. Glauser, our uh, Director of Entrepreneurial Programs, if I might not be able to introduce these speakers. Scott uh, came in uh, a few years ago, four years ago to be exact, and spoke in this same venue, only in a much smaller classroom, right? and did an exceptional job. Now, Scott doesn't know this, but uh, we took a vote uh, at the end of the year, and he was top speaker for that year. And I think part of what you're in for, part, I reviewed that tape this morning as I was, I was watching him, and he got up and he said, you know, I'm not a public speaker. But he got in and he talked to the students, and it was a story that was very believable. It's something that everybody can relate to. You could see yourself doing it. In fact, as he was telling the story of his companies and his startup and whatnot, I was like, gee, I, I wish I'd have done that, you know? And so it's, it's just one of those things that I, I think it's, uh, it's going to be really good, uh, really fun for you to listen to, uh, and a really great uh, story. I don't know Clay as well, but uh, we're going to introduce both of them. The other reason I asked to introduce them is uh, I'm also director of the SEED program here at Utah State. And uh, we, uh, for the last four years, have raised uh, money uh, through classroom projects. And these uh, students go out and do uh, fundraising events of different sorts. And uh, Clay and Scott have supported that many times by uh, donating products to some of these students' groups who have then gone out and sold it and donated the money to our SEED program. Uh, this last summer alone, in Peru, we loaned out over $65,000, and so I'd like to thank these gentlemen for their help in, in uh, participating in that, even though they might not have known they were participating in that. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give Scott's bio first, and uh, I think Clay's going to speak first, so I'll do Scott first, and then uh, Clay uh, is next. Uh, Scott uh, Huskinson co-founded Reminder Band, uh, iFrog's parent company, in uh, November 2004. In 2005, he designed the uh, current three-part component system that makes up unique iFrog's cases. Uh, prior to founding Reminder Band, he worked as a designer for uh, Schwank Incorporated, a New York-based uh, men's accessory company. I think he might have a story on that, too. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> helping it brand and develop a line of retail products. He graduated from Utah State with a bachelor's degree in marketing. Throughout his professional career, he has served on numerous community boards, Mr. Huskinson and his wife, Janae are proud parents of seven. So please welcome Scott. Clay also received a, uh, Clay Broadband also received a degree from Utah State in Communications. Uh, his broad work experience including sales, account development, management. He's worked with Ford Motor Company in Southern Texas. Uh, Corporate Express, an office supply and systems company, and most recently, uh, advertising specialty industry. Clay co-founded Reminder Band in 2004 and uh, iFrogs in 2006. With his business partner, Scott, he's been intimately involved in all areas of both businesses with a major focus on management, vendor relations, quality control, and logistics solutions. Please welcome Clay Broadway. You're up. I was just getting comfortable. Well, we'd like to uh, start out by thanking you for having us and uh, hearing a little bit about our story. Um, if any of you are betting people, you can lay a bet right now which one of us will knock one of these down and how soon into the presentation. Because <laughs> that probably will happen. Um, we wanted to uh, probably, I was, I was glad to hear Mike say at dinner that uh, he just wanted us to kind of reiterate the story. We don't have any presentation, how they put the slide uh, screen up. But it, it is kind of a fun story. And Scott and I have remarked to each other over the years that uh, it's kind of a forest for the trees. You've heard the comment, you, sometimes you don't, hear the, you don't see the forest for the trees. And that's kind of 
how it's been for us over the years um, because it's been such a, a crazy hectic experience and uh, and sometimes it's fun to have events like this to kind of step back and reflect on it a little bit. Um, I'm going to start out uh, from the beginning and uh, tell you a little bit uh, about how everything started and uh, I'll get a little bit into it and, and, and that has some relevance to you as students uh, that are, are looking to uh, you know someday own your own business and uh, uh, and you know go into that field and then uh, I'll turn the time over to Scott to, to kind of flesh out some of the some of the information about uh, iFrogs. Most of you are probably most familiar with iFrogs uh, because it, uh, of the of the two companies, uh, it was the it's the bigger of the two. But the reality of it is, is uh, it all started with a, a little bit of a smaller company called Reminder Band. And Reminder Band started back in um, the fall of 2004. Scott and I have been friends for many years uh, before that and, and as you uh, many of you who know Scott he is a major idea guy he'll sit down and and uh, and he'll come out with idea after idea about businesses and, and, and other things and uh, over the years we've you know we've kicked ideas around and, and had a good time doing those type of things and it just so happened in the fall of 2004 we were both kind of at a, a point in our lives and careers that uh, that we both uh, maybe were looking for something for something new, and it just kind of so happened that the stars aligned for us, and uh, we had an opportunity to start a little online business. And literally, uh, the idea uh, came, and uh, we kind of put our heads together and and did a little bit of research on it. And this is this is when the uh, the Livestrong band was all the rage. Back in back at that time, you couldn't you couldn't. Uh, get the the Lance Armstrong Livestrong band. You had to go on eBay and bid on one and everything like that. Because what had happened is the silicone wristband had come out. I believe that uh, the Livestrong Foundation started that to raise uh, funds for cancer research, and they didn't have an idea of what they were getting into either. And so they, there became such a demand for that uh, that uh, there were, there was a short supply. And about that time. Um, I was working in the ad specialty industry, and I, you know, had a, a customer that was interested in that, and uh, in, in doing a customized band. And so uh, I started looking around, and uh, you know, I, I first told them, "Oh, no problem. You know, we'll be able to do that easily." But when I looked around, uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really find any anywhere. I couldn't even find any online. The only one I found online was. Uh, you had to buy huge quantities and wait months and pay high tooling fees and things like that. And so, so I, I actually, uh, Scott actually called me one day and we were talking about things and, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, hey, do you, do you know anyone that does, uh, does uh, silicone wristbands? And he said, well, I, I don't, but I, I know this uh, contact in Hong Kong. He had been to a, to a trade show over in Hong Kong earlier in the year and he said, why don't you contact them? So to make a, a a long story short there, uh, we kind of went back and forth and I talked to Scott and I, con I contacted this contact and, and it just, it kind of dragged on for a while. Uh, but finally we were able to, to work on that and kind of develop that. And um, what we found is because of the fact that you couldn't get the product easily or quickly or in small quantities, Scott and I kind of brainstormed and said, hey, if we could, if we could uh, develop a way to get this product to just the end consumer quickly in a low quantity uh, with with no uh, upfront charges would there be a demand so we so that so there was the idea and then uh, we through the contact in Hong Kong developed the product and then went out and did the research as far as we got online and we, we uh, looked around to see if there was any demand and we found out there was some demand there were people who wanted you know a couple hundred here or there or even you know 10 or 20 uh, wristbands with their own uh, their own saying on it so so after we kind of worked hard on that and did some development on it we um, we decided wow let's uh, let's put up a website so we paid a whopping five hundred dollars <laughs> a whopping five hundred dollars for a website and uh, it didn't have an ordering system. It didn't have anything. Basically, it was flash-based, and I think it had our cell phone numbers on it, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, 
we thought, well, we'll we'll throw this up and we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. And so we went and did some online advertising and put up the site. And and the next morning we came in and I think we had 60 emails. And uh, they they weren't all orders, but a lot of them were orders and a lot of people asking questions and that. And we said, wow, that's that's pretty crazy. The next day we had 80 emails and then we had 100 more emails. And uh, it just absolutely, we had no idea what we were getting into. And it just kind of kind of blew the roof off. And so from there, we, we literally were, were two guys on cell phones in a storage shed. And uh, I don't know whether we had a storage shed at that time, but, but we immediately were thrown into the process of what do we, you know, what do we do now? We had, we had ordered bands in and we had a way to put the phrase on them here. But the demand was, was so tremendous right out of the gate that we were pretty overwhelmed. And so right from the beginning, uh, you know, we were working 20 hours a day. Our wives will attest to that. We were sleeping at the office um, or, or at, the, at the storage shed, I should say. And, uh, you know, we were shipping the bands. We were, we were doing the whole thing. And uh, one kind of good story, with every, which everyone likes, is is once the bands are produced, they have to be cleaned. And so this is, this is in November, and uh, we didn't have a way to clean them. So we actually would get the pr bands produced during the day, and we'd get them in the evening, and we'd take them to the car wash. And where you put your floor mats up, we'd put bands up. And one of us would change the bands, and the other one would wash them. And uh, and so uh, we did this, and we'd come back, and we'd be we'd be frozen. And I won't tell you that whole story, but but uh, but it was uh, it was a pretty crazy time, and we were faced with the with the task of of meeting the demand uh, of of the product, uh, and also of putting a business together under it. And um, neither of us had a lot of uh, management skill as far as managing employees and things like that. Our families helped us. We, we were hiring temps, and and uh, and it was just a real crazy time. And it be and it it continued on like that. Uh, and so, from the two of us, I think in, in a matter of a couple months, we had uh, 25 employees. And you know, we had to we had to do customer service. We had to you know continue with the production of them. We had to continue with the marketing and the shipping and all the things that go go with a business and a and a small product. So. It was a very it was a very crazy time at the beginning, and um, we you know we were fortunate enough to hire a lot of good people. We've had a lot of good people over the years help us, and that's that's what uh, what's really made a success out of out of both businesses. But um, what what had happened is what we tried to do from the beginning is we tried to build this is a this was uh, almost 100% online business, and so we tried to build. The structure of the site, so that you could plug other products into it, because we didn't know how uh, how long wristbands would be would be the craze. Uh, most of you are, are too young, uh, but if you look back to the cycles of products, you can you know things like Beanie Babies and Pogs and and things like that come to mind of products that came out and they burned really hot and they just flamed out. Now, you know you. If you fa find one, you can probably sell it on eBay for a lot of money because it's you know you can't find them anymore. They're not they're not a viable product anymore. And so we didn't know whether this was going to be something that would go for two or three months, whether it would go for six months, whether you know just just what it would do. And so we tried to build that structure and that skeleton so we could put other products in there. And as as part of that whole process, uh, there are a couple things that looking back that that we made a couple decisions that really really helped us in the long run. And one of them uh, was, to be, was to be very hands-on in the whole business. And so um, the bands that, that we produced were produced in southern China. And so we, have, uh, we, we almost immediately booked a trip to go to southern China to look at other products, but to, to get in the factories and see how the product was produced, meet the factory owners, and to work with our partners in Hong Kong uh, who, who were our original source, our original sourcing company. And um, that, that, that is one thing that's served us very well over the years. Um, I know Scott will probably touch on it a little bit, but as, as, 
as reminder band developed into iFrogs and got bigger and, and got into the retail side of it, we many times have met uh, other business owners or, or, or high people in, in different businesses that have never been to a factory, they've, they've never been to China or anything like that. But in the beginning, what that enabled us to do is it enabled us to understand the product as simple as the product as a, a, a wristband is. It helped us, helped us understand uh, the product of silicone and what you could do with it and what you couldn't do with it. And uh, it helped us forge some pretty, pretty good relationships that have, uh, have been very beneficial for both uh, us and, and those that we forged relationships over the years. So that's one thing that has really served us well. The other thing thing that I think is, has served us well is um, Scott and I from the beginning looked at this and said wow you know it was just it was just such a uh, such a great thing for us and we were just so you know thankful that we were so fortunate to kind of kind of put that together um, we've always turned around and tried to share when the company was was uh, prosperous with the employees and um, that that in a lot of in a lot of ways, I know that isn't a, a business 101, and this isn't going to be a business 101 story. So I'm sorry if I step on toes of professors or whatever. But but it's a, it's it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit out of the norm. But over the years, we've you know we've continued to try to do that, uh, and it, it's not always possible because as Scott will talk about a little bit when a when a business uh, experiences explosive growth, a lot of those resources are are. are are sucked back into the business to, to build inventories and, and to build infrastructure and things like that. But when we've had the opportunity to do that, we've done that. And um, because we realized early on that, that the, whole, the whole experience is, is, it's not just one or two guys, it's a, it's a whole business. It's, it's every single part of the business, whether it's the marketing department or sales or management or accounting or shipping. All of those things have to happen, and they have to happen right for a business to be successful. So, kind of back to the reminder band story. Reminder band. Uh, I, I I talked to uh, Scott a little bit about this, and and generally, our philosophy over the years has been to kind of try to fly below the radar, um, just because that's kind of our personalities, uh, and we generally don't share numbers or things like that. But I think this evening. We're going to do a little bit of that just because that's kind of the purpose to 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 let all you students know hey here are the you know here are the possibilities and here's some things that that can happen uh, uh, for the positive if you you know if you look at it so we'll do that where we're not always really comfortable with doing that but to to give you an idea reminder band uh, in the first year. I should know this exact number, but we sold somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to nine million wristbands online, and generated about eleven million dollars in uh, in sales. And um, it was a pretty amazing experience. And and what had what had happened though in the reminder band story is is it enabled us, and this is this is a little different than making a business plan, taking it to the bank, uh, looking for capital in, in places but the reason that this model works great for us is because customers would get online they'd order the bands but we we would take the payment first so we would we would take the credit card payment since it's a customized product it's not you know you don't return it and so um, we really as a business capitalized uh, immediately and uh, we you know we never were in a line of, of, of credit uh, to, to any to any extent until we got into the kind of the the, the heavy lifting days of iFrogs and Scott will touch on that a little bit I'm sure but reminder band uh, burned very hot for the first part of 2005 and continued to to go well in the fall of 2005 it started to decline somewhat and so we didn't know again whether well this is the end of reminder band or what and so what we did is we started to, to look for other products. So we traveled to Asia, we traveled to China, we traveled to Thailand looking for other, uh, other products, even though Reminder Band was still doing well. And as part of that, uh, as, as was said in the introduction, uh, we thought, 
Well, what we understand now is we understand silicone. We understand what you can do with silicone, what you can't do, and um, you know what could we do with silicone as a as a as a product is kind of the next step. And as was said in the outset, uh, Scott had the vision of hey let's let's do iPod cases. And at that time, the iPod Classic was the big flagship uh, iPod. And we said okay, well we need to do our due diligence and we need to go out there and see what competition and you know is out there because we knew we were going to be laid into the game there because the iPod was already out there were a lot of cases and things like that but what we found is there wasn't a lot of pizzazz out there there was a black case there was a white case and that was about it everything was kind of vanilla and so that's as was mentioned that's where the the concept of the three-part case came up and I think when we when we finally what we did is we, we went to China and, and started putting a, a line together uh, for iFrogs. And I think starting out of the gate, we had 30-some colors of cases that you could get online. And then uh, that three-component system had a, a band to, could, to uh, protect the ports as part of it. That you could Another 30 colors so you could mix and match. And it also had uh, 100 or something different uh, types of art that were basically a decal that you could put on your on your click wheel and uh, on your navigation wheel. And so we uh, we launched iFrogs as strictly an online business in uh, in March of 2006. And reminder band, you know, was still going, but we we did that and um, and Thing, things came out of the out of the gate well. It was nothing like Reminder Band as far as the volume and the demand uh, to start off with, but uh, it went well. But almost immediately, uh, people started uh, coming to us and say, "You need to put this into retail." Well, retail scared us a lot because uh, there are many more pitfalls into retail than you get into accounts receivable and you get into contracts and you get into dealing with all of this, which we weren't familiar with. And uh, we, so we resisted uh, initially, and so uh, we just get, kept getting that feedback. You need to take this product into retail. This would be great in retail. And so at the throughout most of 2006, we heard that. And so about mid-year, we said, "Well, what what should we do?" And we said, "Okay, what we'll do is we'll put together uh, a retail line, and we'll go to uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, which is the big Consumer Electronics Show." in uh, Las Vegas is in January of every year. Uh, there are thousands of vendors. It brings in a quarter of a million people from all over the world. And um, we basically said, we'll do that and we'll, we'll get a small booth and we'll go there with prototypes. And, uh, and that is, I think, where I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand it off to Scott to kind of talk more about iFrogs and how things develop there. And um, I'm probably going to sit over there and heckle him. So I invite you to do the same if you if you're so inclined. So, and then I guess uh, after Scott's done, we'll have uh, some question and answer time, where we'll both stand up here and and uh, we'll we'll dispute. Good evening. Um, if you guys will just. Uh, Play along with me for a second. I've, you know, this will be the ultimate. Um, I could die as soon as I say this. Okay, I'd like to thank you for being here, and all you joining remotely from universities, campuses all over the state. I guess I've always wanted to talk remotely, so you people in. <laughs> So when this gets replayed, which I guess it will, people think, wow, he's talking to a lot of people. There's two up there. <laughs> Are you guys married or a couple? Yes? Thumbs up? Good. If not, <laughs> I hope so, because it looks like the dating pool is kind of small. So. Um, Let me loosen things up just a little bit, like I haven't already, but, and I'll, I'll explain why in a second. So, 
I want anyone, I want a male and a female that have a hole in their sock to show me the hole in their sock. You can't make the hole in your sock. And I've got a $100 bill for each hole in the sock, just for the, the first one. You got, it happens to be my son's roommate, but, but hey. <laughs> hey, those are my socks. Cade steals my socks all the time. Billy, uh, do we have a female? Let me see. That's fine. I'm just I want to see a hole in the sock. That, okay. <laughs> Let me explain why. I went to, uh, not too many years ago, I went to a partners in business where an executive from Southwest spoke. And she did the same thing. And I had a hole in my sock and I got a free Southwest ticket anywhere they fly. And, and I thought, Tonight, as I was thinking back to that, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and so that's why I did that. <laughs> so, uh, um, if I own Southwest, I'd give you a ticket to Southwest. Um, first off, I'll get serious for a second. Um, um, because I'll get busy talking and I won't say that. So I'm going to say it right out of the shoot, is uh, uh, a guy couldn't ask for a better business partner than Clay Broadbent. He's, uh, he's uh, very, very loyal, very dedicated, and, uh, and a true friend. Um, and we set a record tonight. That's the longest I've let him talk without interrupting him. And I said a second record is this is the longest I've ever sit in a Utah State classroom without leaving. So, um, um, what's interesting is once you start a little business and it does something, all of a sudden you're alumni. But no one asked what your GPA was, and I don't even want to post that. But I barely sp uh, spoke through college when I graduated. Um, we have a picture in our house, my graduation picture, and you were pregnant with with our sixth. We have seven children. So I graduated, I believe, in 2003. That's one. Well, I retook some classes and did it again. No, I <laughs> um, so I'm relatively familiar with, with uh, the lifestyle that you guys are living. I took a lot of night classes. Um, and campus um, because it was just to come to really, I, I didn't have a lot of social life because I had six kids, or soon to be six. And, um, but, um, I'm going to give a few little disclaimers. I, my wife, you think, wow, I'll bet she gives him some really cool advice. Her advice is finish your sentences. I have a real hard time. My mind uh, typically is uh, running faster than my mouth or vice versa. And so I apologize to you that are taking notes. How many of you are here because you're required to be here? Come on, don't be shy. Oh, that's not bad. Because I was, and so you have to turn in something. And if I sing a song, can you turn it in for humanities too? or? <laughs> Or just so. Um, let me tell you about iFrog. So Clay did a really good job. Reminder band. Um, when I tell it, there's a lot more about me in it, but that's okay. <laughs> um, reminder band was an amazing, uh, amazing journey. Um, and I understand our background. We didn't come from. Um, we started pretty, and I don't want to make this uh, all emotional or anything, but we started very humbly in, in this little business. And the reason I share it, um, Mike Bowser at dinner said, you know, what we hope is that when people leave, they feel like, well, if they can do it, we can do it. And I said, I promise I'll do that. <laughs> you guys will leave going, you can do it even better, you know. Um, but when we started, we didn't have a... We didn't have a, uh, we didn't do focus groups. We didn't build a business plan. 
paid a guy in Mendon to build this little website, and we posted it, and uh, it was the perfect timing for the product that we launched. And, uh, and then we figured everything else out as we went. Our wives that are sitting right here um, went a long time without seeing us. They would come down and package orders, and it was amazing. When we first started selling wristbands, they cost us about a quarter to make in China about another quarter to customize them here in the U.S. And they were selling for about 250 a wristband at the time. And we would work all night. And the story that Clay didn't finish that I'm going to is um, one night we came back and he was sopping. These Cameron and Tanner over here work dive frogs. They're laughing because they've heard the story before. But we came back from the car wash. It was the car there, car wash. I don't know if they still call it Yates but just right there and our office was down behind LW's and uh, um, you think we could turn that into a museum or something kind of like they do in, in like out, out at Walmart they have the first office it's not that important anyways um, we came back and we're sitting there washing the bands and uh, so and I had one of the jobs you got really wet, but I had the dry job that night. And it was, I'm not joking, 15 below, it was cold. And we get back and we had to get all these wristbands processed and clay was soft and wet. And so he uh, took his pants off and hung them over the heater. And that whole night he, he uh, packaged wristbands in his underwear and, and uh, in fact, I've got a slideshow. We can put it up. Um, but the reason I share that is to make sure you understand that um, it is attainable. It's, uh, it's almost emotional to us to talk about it because um, we feel so blessed and so fortunate to have the experience that we've had. And, um, when we started the business, I had, had one stamp on my passport, and that was the trip. About six months earlier, I decided to go to China just because I wanted to see what it was about. And uh, and uh, the uh, journey of iFrogs has been... Um, so when we started, there was a sense I just didn't finish. So I apologize, you keep keeping notes. Just put a dot, dot, dot. Um, so we went to CES. Like Clay said, and that was going to be our launch into retail. To give you an idea, we went from selling wristbands, um, and I'll just share even some really exciting numbers. Uh, so we had one day selling wristbands. It was online. All the money would drop, drop into credit card accounts before our, uh, before we even shipped. So there was some receivable story about. And uh, our biggest day, we sold 180 thousand dollars in wristbands in a 24-hour period. We used to joke about our job being refreshing because we'd hit the refresh button on the keyboard. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, there's not a refresh button on a keyboard, but there was a little refresh button on our interface that we had built. And we'd refresh it. And there's times um, you'd go to lunch and you'd come back and hit refresh and $12,000 in orders. And it was just phenomenal. Just, And we didn't know. I grew up in Montana. Um, and um, Clay is a local from here, and we'd never been exposed to that type of volume or that there was even that many people that existed, you know, that, who were buying these wristbands. <laughs> um, and so that was one of the first things we realized is, wow, this is a big market, and it never goes to sleep. And there's people ordering wristbands at 2 in the morning that say, you know, um, I love Vernal or whatever. Who's from Vernal up there? Oh, they're asleep. Sorry. <laughs> um, but it was it was just amazing to to see that, and we went from not having a hey, no, how are you doing? Um, we went from having no experience. We were using our cell phones. I remember being in San Diego on a uh, on another business idea. Because Reminder Band was just starting, and myself, we'd had to take our cell phone numbers off the website. 
and just email only. And I'm getting on an airport shuttle that took you from the rental car agency back to the airport. And I get this call, and I'm like, who's this? I answer it. And this lady said, oh, uh, I'm so glad I got through to you. And she started crying and um, saying, it, this is meant to be and all this. I'm like, wow. what is? And it was a lady that was trying to contact us to order wristbands. And on the bottom of our website, there was a, the name of our um, web developer. And she called him, and he gave us Scott Gutke, right? Um, he now teaches down at BYU web stuff, but um, gave gave her he gave her my number, and she had to get these orders these, these wristbands ordered for someone that was sick. Um, early on, we decided we will never do live strong bracelets. We would never produce a band that did live strong because we didn't want to cut into the cancer foundation. This was all about let's do wristbands for other uh, other um, uh, you know causes and other purposes. So I've got a timer set here and I'm going to run out. Um, so the wristband business was just amazing and here we got all these amazing employees and as it started to die, or we knew it was a fad and it was going to taper off and it went from doing fifty and $60,000 a day to $20,000 a day and we thought, oh no, here it comes. And that's when we launched Bifrox. We thought, hey, our, our factories can produce silicone, they can do small quantities, and we started. And so the first year online, we launched on March 6th of 06, we launched the website called iFrogs, and it was just get on, you could build a case. You had a little wristband that went around the edge of the case, and silicone body, and then what we called wheel art, like Clay said, and you could build your own case. And uh, that, that launched, we had good search engine optimization, team by that point and in the first year from March till the end of the year we did um, 54,000 orders something like that um, and about 1.6 million dollars in sales and had some amazing breaks the Today Show we're in China and all of a sudden the website numbers are going crazy and found out the Today Show was featured as one of the best gifts for tweens on at Christmas and um, so then we launched, when we launched iFrogs.com for, for retail, we went to CES, um, and the first customer that we that expressed interest was Virgin Mega Stores in the Middle East. It was a company uh, called the Azeda Group. They own around nine Virgin Mega Stores. They're based out of Dubai, and, and they called me and said, "Hey, we want to place an order." How's, and I said, well, I'm coming to Hong Kong next week. How about if I just come see you guys? Not realizing that it's like 18 hours, I think, between Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm thinking, hey, it's... Uh, and so I went and saw them. And, uh, and uh, we met. They were, guy, they were these uh, Lebanese guys. Um, they took me out to dinner and, and gave me... Oh, that's it. So we'll finish the story later. No. Um, it was just an amazing experience. They wanted to place an order. The next morning, they, they go to cut the POs, and they say, uh, throw out your part numbers. And I'm like, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> so, because uh, we'd been an online business, we didn't have UPCs and all this. And so I sat there in their conference room on the phone with the office in Logan. And we got on a little UPC building tool online and assigned part numbers, and they placed a $65,000 order, and that was our first. And that was a key order, because Virgin Mega Stores has a big name, and it really gave us credibility. So the first year, and I hope I get these numbers right, and then I'm going to turn it, but the first year we, um, in retail, we did $800,000 in retail sales. Um, and, the se and that was the second year of the online, and online still did around 1.4. And so we were convinced we were still just an online business. Um, and the second year, we uh, we heard we uh, developed a product called the Audio Wraps. It was for the 3G Nano, and it was the ability to put speakers in a little case so that when you put your iPod in there, it would amplify it. I think Apple stole our idea because it's in all the devices now. But back then, you know, there wasn't. That was a joke. Please laugh. No. <laughs> um, 
uh, and we're at CES, and I'm just touching on some of the cool little things that have, uh, and we'd heard from our rep group that Walmart was interested, but they never came to our booth. And uh, I left, as I'd been to China, I think, prior, and so I left the last day of the show early and got a ride to the airport. And on the way to the airport, I'm talking to Jeff and Kent and saying, hey, uh, if Walmart stops by by chance, we've got to do this, this, and this. And I was explaining, this is just, you don't make this stuff, well, I might make it up, but this is real, I promise. And I'm explaining what Eric Bright looks like. Um, and I look up. And he's getting out of the taxi in front of us in the Las Vegas airport. I said, that's him right there. He was the Walmart buyer. I'm sorry, I thought I had to throw that detail in. This is the head buyer at Walmart. And as he walks towards the curb, I said, hey, Eric. And now we talked, and we stood there, and we talked for over a half hour. And I actually said, and he goes, well, I don't think you have enough inventory, do you? I said, no, we, we pre-built 50,000, and uh, I'll take them all. And I said, wow, this will make a cool book someday. I mean, here I'm meeting Walmart in the airport. And, and uh, we got into Walmart, and they took them. And they bought 64, 70,000. And they were projecting they'd sell um, 9,000 a week. And the first week, we're excited to get the report. And I think they sold under 100, 92, something like that. And... Uh, and uh, and the next week, it didn't get better. And so then the call come to talk about, you got to buy these things with this back. And uh, because of good relationships that, that, that had been developed, we, we said, well, what about audio? We'd never done. We'd done one pair of earbuds. To give you an idea, when we first launched our first pair of earbuds, it was called the D33s. They were named the D33s because Kent Withrich, who's our designer and has been done an incredible job for us, he actually teaches up here on, uh, he liked Tony Dorsett, and Tony Dorsett's number was number 33. <laughs> we called them D33s. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I won't tell you what the, why, where the name BS55, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but so we talked to him and said, can we, can we um, somehow get into audio? And he said, well, there's a, there was an opening because Skullcandy at the time refused to sell to Walmart. And I knew they were missing this. This was the hottest headphones out there. And, but Walmart uh, couldn't get them. And so um, I just said, can we try to develop something? And um, he said, yes. And um, we went and our team jumped right in. To it in a matter of weeks, we had samples and flew back out to Bentonville and presented, and he loved it. And he said, can, "The only problem is we can't need these in two months for back to school. Can you do it? We want a shipper, which is a cardboard port." And we said, "Of course, we'll do whatever." And a few days later, I actually took my son Kate, who's with me, and we went to China and worked on this shipper, and we worked on packaging that didn't need molds or tooling. To, and this was our break because we were going to get rid of. They were going to trade out the money that, that we were going to have to pay them for buying back the audio wrap for all this. Um, in the fall, as the order got ready to ship, we at the company had a Walmart-themed summer party out in Providence. We rented the movie theater and we were going to watch the movie Wally. I wouldn't recommend. Um, we had all the food came from Walmart. We had gift cards all the employees, and here again, you can't make this stuff up. On the way, as we're standing in line, um, uh, I get a call from the buyer, and he said, I just got the sample. And now we had one container already on the water and three containers on their way to the port of all this product. And he says, Walmart, this doesn't meet specs. This doesn't meet, we can't bring this in. And uh, I'm like, what do you mean? And it was, it was just, uh, um, I said, we're having a Walmart party. What's going on? What's, you can't do this to us, you know? <laughs> like, we bought your six-foot hoagie. I mean, what's the what's up with it? Um, but uh, a few days later, I flew back out there, and we worked out a deal where they said, well, 
we'll take all the earbuds that are on the shipper and for the fourth quarter we'll put them on, put them on and it, this uh, this was big um, in that first in that fourth quarter we were selling almost a hundred thousand earbuds a week through Walmart just a, a skew called the plug and, uh, and that really saved our bacon it really did that year we did um, that was the second year we did. So we went from doing 800,000 to 5.8, something like that. And then the next year we went to 27 million in sales. And the next year, 42 million. And then this year we sold the Zag. Um, and we uh, are, will do north of 60 million in 2011. And a lot of that has just happened just um, from uh, a lot of luck, a lot of. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm not a big guy on quotes, and, um, is Rupert Mur Murdoch um, once said that, if I can get it right, is that, uh, that the world is changing. Uh, big will no longer beat small, but fast will beat slow. And I really believe, because of the amazing team that we have, that, that was our key, because when these retailers needed something, we would do anything to, to get it to them and really fulfill that need. We're now um, distributed throughout the whole world, um, places that I can't even pronounce or know where they're at. Um, it's, uh, we're in AT&T, have great partnerships with them and Best Buy. And the thing that's also amazing is these people, whether they're, they're buy, a buyer that buys $30 million or a buyer that buys um, a buyer at a college bookstore. They're all just normal, everyday, real people. They're just trying to do a job. And what we try to do is uh, make their job easier by getting them great products and, 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 and taking care of their needs. Um, I wish I had some splashy in, but I really don't. So if you don't mind, do we just um, turn it over to questions? Yes? Okay. So I guess we're going to take some questions. And how long do we have to, for questions, Dave? OK. We'll let them choose if they Yes. Damn that close together, I guess. <laughs> um, you know what that is? A lot of it happened is that as we looked at the business, um, we got into the iPod accessory business, and we didn't plan this. It's just in hindsight, when, when no one else was there, per se. There was Falcon and Griffin and some of those. Um, but as we have grown the business, one of the things is we always have felt like we're kind of um, flying by the seat of our pants in order to stay. I mean, it's like they said, we never needed to get a loan until the business did $40 million, which is kind of contrary to what you'd think. You'd think, oh, you need a loan at the beginning. No, we needed a loan once it got big, and you have Walmart wanting big shipments, 50,000 of this, and AT&T wanting 103. You know, they were ordering 300,000 cases at a time. And, and as we saw the maturity of the business, and the industry and the amount of competition, we just knew that um, the best thing we can do is, is uh, join with someone that we can scale and be bigger. And truthfully, a few years ago, I didn't even know the word scale. Um, but as we've, as we've uh, done that, we know that to be the case. Uh, retailers, especially in the iPod accessory space, are really, um, it's a challenging business to get in, and many retailers have never dealt with a form factor where a phone goes from the 3G to the 4, and now what do they do with all their inventory? And so it's it's and and they never know in advance. People always ask, "Oh, does, does Apple talk to you?" I, no, I don't. I honestly don't know if employees at Apple, besides way up the line, even know, because you see the same things in their distribution channel where, they're you know, um, and so. That's kind of the reason, is, is as we looked at it. And, uh, and then uh, 
we also had to look at the offer. It's, it's public. I'll tell you know everyone probably knows. I think it was even you know we sold for 105 million dollars, which was uh, I don't even know if I can spell that, but it was a lot, you know. And we had to look at it. And one of our goals always was to share it with our employees. And and uh, you have to get to a point where you're going, wow, we could mess this up, or we could, you know, get big take some money off the table, and then keep moving forward. And, and uh, we don't regret the, the Zag deal at all. It's been great. Um, the other thing is the problem we face is if we got bigger, then we'd be out of the realm of, of probably being able to be acquired. We would then start crossing over and competing. At the time, Zag and us were, Zag wanted to buy us when we were about a $2 million company. And at the time, their stock was around 40 cents. So it would have been probably about the same type deal. But at the time, it just didn't fit what we wanted to accomplish. Our goal was to have this be a payday for everybody. And as we did that, um, and that's really not even that public, but, but it, was, uh, it was probably the greatest day of my life. As we sat there with people that we love and care about, and at 2 o'clock we shared, and norm, we haven't even shared this, but we sat with them at, and at 2 p.m. we had a, a meeting and it was announced on on the wire and everything and we met with everyone and told them that this wouldn't affect their jobs and the, what our plans were. And then we asked to meet with each of them individually and our wives were there because most of these employees are like family to us. And uh, they came in and, and uh, we had checks already cut out and uh, it, was, uh, it was very enjoyable very emotional and uh, was so fun we want to do it with you guys no I'm <laughs> uh, so yeah. instead of <laughs> so instead of ice cream no David um, we did as I, as I mentioned we did back in the reminder days we did online advertising and when iFrog started out, we did some, but the, the reality of it is, is is that the company had such explosive growth that we were kind of almost doing everything we could to keep our arms around it. Um, and one thing that you know Scott alluded to as, as far as the acquisition was that one of the things that we didn't realize until we got there was that when you see a company grow like, like that, you think, oh wow, those guys are, you know, they're doing great and everything like that. And we were doing great, but it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the company to to fund the growth, basically. So you 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 know, everyone looks at it and oh, Scott and Clay are doing great. Well, the fact is, yeah, if you want to count millions and millions of dollars in inventory as great, that as, as was said, this is a the consumer electronics industry and specifically the case industry because Apple comes out with a new phone every year is a very volatile industry. And those of you who know anything about Apple, they don't release anything until the device actually comes out. So you're looking at things over the years that we've had to risk build. So we, you know, we make es estimations at, at specs and we might build tens of thousands of type of one type of case and tens of thousands of another type of case, knowing half of those are going to go in the landfill at no, you know, at no cost uh, or no profit to us and all costs in, in that. So, so we, over the years, we didn't do a tremendous amount of advertising. Um, but uh, as Scott said, which I think was very accurate, we gained the reputation in the industry of being a very nimble company, able to react to what our customers wanted, um, you know, had a lot of, of, of new ideas, innovative things. Um, you know, and, and Scott is awesome at that. And that's, you know, that's really helped over the, over the time. You try well, to make my, us cry. Well, my son, I have a son that his letters from prison say it didn't affect him. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah. It was, uh, I missed that. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, my first wife. She liked it. And wife number two, she liked, She didn't mind the travel. No. One wife. She's awesome. And Lisa's the same. Um, you know, different, different parts of the business. Um, we went through, we, and we don't talk, but we went through a major lawsuit. We went through different things that just like the Walmart thing where it was not an option. It was survival. It was, we get over there and save this or we won't have a business. Um, and so, uh, very understanding. Uh, in fact, it got to the point where, because I was going to China six and then eight times a year and traveling just, uh, I mean, I went from not needing a passport to I've added pages, I think, four times in the last five years. And I'm, and that's not something to be proud of, by the way. That's just to, el to illustrate the, the um, but, uh, lost track of what I was going to say. It, uh, it, you know, it, it, it does, it, it put a lot of pressure on the family, you know, over the years. And our wives have been fantastic. Our kids have been fantastic. But there are times that, you know, you wrestle with that. And that's the real reason you sell your business. Because your wife can only hear you say, well, hey, next month's going to be the month, you know. <laughs> so I'll be home next month. Yeah. But uh, anyway, question. I'm, yes. <laughs> you know what? We're not good at that stuff, and I think legally we can't even say anything. Um, um, so, next question. <laughs> this is Glenn in Richfield. I have a question if you have a chance. I don't, I don't yeah. mean to walk on anyone else who's already started a question. Um, There's only three here, so that's not a problem. Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> Maybe each had a question. Okay. Well, I, I have an online retail site that I started, uh, also related to iPods. My question to you is, what at the beginning, what was the cost for, for online marketing and how did you source that? Like the monthly cost before you started seeing, um, you know, where the, where the, uh, the expense and the profit, it, you know, uh, canceled each other out and then you began making profit? or was it just straight into profits and whatnot? Okay. Well, to give you an idea, when we first when we first set up our our uh, Google search, our Google AdWords, this is no joke. I remember type setting up the account and putting a ten dollar a day budget and putting on my credit card, and I'm awful with passwords. Of I thought I better keep my password because if I forget this, it's just going to keep ringing my card for the next however long <laughs> and uh, and in the and so we started with that and in the peak of reminder band it seemed like the more money we spent the it was like a silent salesperson this Google AdWords now a lot of that that does I can't speak to the relevance of that today but at that time with that product it just like the more you we had days where we were spending ten thousand dollars a day on Google AdWords in fact, when we spent a million dollars, they sent us a little mini refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> it's our, who has that? Did you guys have that nice piece? It was our Google million dollar fridge. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, one thing to mention there too is that we were paying how much per click? I can't even. I can't. Even. It was. It was like five cents, twenty-five cents, and yeah. some of those keywords now you pay eight dollars for per click. But one thing to answer, your, you're in Richfield. One thing to answer your question is, we had such an incredible SEO team that when we launched iPods.com, within months, when you type in the word iPod cases, we came up organically before Apple. And that was our big claim to fame for a long time. Is, is, uh, um, was that? Is you know, um, so, I hope that helps. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Thank 
Yeah. Let me let me start, and then I'll hand that off to Scott. And, and thanks for asking. Because Reminder Band is a business, and iFrogs obviously are two completely different businesses. And one of the things, as I mentioned when we started iFrogs, is we were late into the game. And so, yes, from the beginning, the idea was to to uh, develop the product as kind of a cool brand, a lifestyle brand. I mean, we've said many times over the years that you know the iPod is you know was the hottest thing, and now the iPhone is the hottest thing. But there are people that will argue with you as to whether it's the actually technically the best device. But it is the coolest device. And so we went at it from that angle. Uh, Scott mentioned Kent Woodridge was a fantastic uh, creative guy, has very, you know, very good ideas. Scott has a lot of good ideas there. And so, yeah, that was a, that was a big part of it and, and continues to be a big part of it for, for iFrog because that is a younger demographic. You know, you're shooting for with that product. When we entered the market, we really, and I don't think we, we had all the different colors originally just because we wanted to be different and we wanted people to be able to customize. What we quickly realized is that exactly what Clay said the iPod and most Mac products, they're all, it's, it's just, they're the end, they're the cool thing. And the story I've, I've used before is like if we were at CES and just so happened to have our booth next to Bill Gates. Microsoft, and he goes, hey, you guys are good guys. Here's a couple of Zooms. I think our kids would go, Dad? Uh, oh, and then we took them home and said, hey, look what we brought back. Our kids would look at us like we're trying to get them to wear tough skin Levi's or something. <laughs> and even though, sorry, Microsoft fans, uh, but, <laughs> but it really is the cool factor. And so we, we really realized that we have to make it fashionable we had to, you know, uh, our, our tagline has always been protection meets style. And that was the idea. Because when we first started, there was the, a lot of just clear cases out there. There was Griffin and Belton and some of those. And we used to say, if you took it out of the package, the packaging, you wouldn't know whether it's a Griffin or a Belton. Because it was, now they've all done colors and stuff now. And I'm not saying we invented colors on iPod cases. But that was just something we saw early on. What are you guys going to do now? <laughs> Um, Any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll get a few calls, Clay. Um, you know, we, uh, I, uh, Clay is, so when, when Zag bought us, they only bought remind, um, iFrog. So Clay is now running Reminder Band 100%. And I'm under contract with Zag for the next uh, couple of years. Because um, iFrog is still being run as a uh, subsidiary of Zag and uh, just continue to grow the business. And, you know, one other thing to that point is that what, what we found is when we went to China, it, it kind of expands your horizons as far as the, the way that that culture produces product and the possibilities. And so we, we have many uh, brainstorming sessions still. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Scott could probably rip off 10 ideas for you here in just a second. but. Rip off does that imply I would steal them? <laughs> can this be edited? So can someone share some ideas? I'll rip them off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in, but anyway, you know that that that's the that's the beauty of going through an experience like this, is that you you know you can look at it and say, hey, you know you look and you see where there's a, de a demand for for something, because the reality of it is there are a lot of good ideas, but if in the end if the consumer it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's just like the audio rap story. I mean, that you're right. You couldn't make that story up. That that, that product won awards at Macworld and yes, and it hit the shelf, and it was a total dog because the consumer didn't get it. It was a cool product, but the consumer didn't get it. It didn't sell, so it didn't work. Is what we call the word we use is it wasn't understandable. And so there's a lot of cool ideas that that. You know, I think business is a lot like American Idol, where there's a lot of great voices out there, but they just they can't get heard until they get on American Idol. And then there's a lot of lousy voices that are on the radio, and you're like, what's up with this? You know, it's 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 the it's it's true. And there's it's the same way in business. You walk into into a retailer, and you're like, someone bought this? Are you kidding me? You know, and um and and through those types of experience, the whole dollar store industry was 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 built. You know. Um, 
I guess, I guess I'm not going to be selling to the dollar store industry, basically. Um, so um, it's, it, it, is, uh, it is enlightening, and I hope, if anything, that's what you guys take out of it is, and we're not just saying this. I mean, it, uh, it, I truly believe that with the, with the right luck, um, it's awkward. I've shared this with uh, Steve Eaton, who met with me a couple times, and I hope this doesn't create any awkwardness, but it's, it's hard to uh, stand here and take credit because we know that, that uh, we've been blessed and, and uh, there's been things that have happened in our business that are not any power that, that we've done. That may not be politically correct on the campus, but I guess it will be my last speaking engagement. But, um, <laughs> but truly, um, we, we would be amiss if we didn't uh, um, put some credit there because it's, there's just things that there's no way that we were that smart. Truthfully, yes. Um, I, I think I think what you have to do is if you if you can afford to get into it and try it and um, you have to have you know I think, I think there's too many businesses out there that. Like, hey, I've made these little pot holders, and everyone at the reunion loved them. And you have to be really honest with yourself. We do it in every product development that we look at. We say, wow, this is cool, but we can't get too attached to it because the consumer isn't, um, in some cases, they're your family, but they can only buy so much. And so <laughs> eventually, reality's got to set in. And, and so, you know, um, we've done a lot of things just flying by the seat of our pants. We don't do any market research. Uh, I think it's really important to know the industry that you're in. And if you feel passionate about it and you share it with friends and they feel passionate about it, you can kind of take the consensus and go, well, what's the odds of this? It's like we were talking about an idea at the table we were sitting at. And wow, four, four people think it's a good idea. There's only six of us here. My wife uh, wasn't listening because she's sick of. <laughs> she's not listening now. She said <laughs> we had a little episode uh, when we left. We said to our ten-year-old, Janae said, "Don't, don't call us." And, and I said, "Yeah." And she goes, "Unless it's emergency." I said, "Yeah, like if someone dies." And we were at the dinner, and we got a call that our dog got hit and, and killed. <laughs> Which, in case my little girls are watching this someday, I'm really sad. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I got over it. And I, it was a great dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't potty trained, and so what, one more one more follow up to that is is the consumer electronics industry is such a fast moving industry um, that a lot of times, again, it isn't a it, it isn't a traditional brick and mortar as they say industry, and so. Sometimes you don't have the time to do that. You don't have the luxury to do that. You have to, you have to, as they say, throw something up against the wall. If it sticks, you run with it. If it doesn't, you throw the next thing up. That's a great point. Yeah. In this industry, people that are doing market studies are not on the shelf at Walmart because you've got to act fast. You can't. I mean, the devices are coming out so fast, and and uh, and I'm not against market studies and stuff. It's just. It, that we, it's not something, I guess we're one example that we know of that it worked, that we didn't do it. So. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, in in the case of iFrogs, I'd say absolutely, um, because in in that particular trade show, you get, you know, you get all over the world. And it, interestingly enough, uh, the biggest in, in interest in iFrogs to start out with wasn't domestically in the U.S. It was international. Scott mentioned the Middle East. 
We did well in Europe. I, IFROG sells in over 40 countries throughout the world. But the exposure was, was uh, very vital for us to start out with. And then as we kind of, you know, gained a little bit more, man, more, more momentum, uh, you know, it just, it just picked up and, and got going and, and became a spot where our existing customers would also come and see us there too. So it's very, you know, it's very important for that. When, when I was going to Utah State, I had a craft business. We did wooden Christmas ornaments. I would sit and it's where I really got to know Clay. He'd come down at 2 in the morning and help me sweep up sawdust or whatever it needed done because he kept saying, you're going to kill yourself because I live there. I remember my kids um, coming down in the minivan to bring me dinner. And we did trade shows. I would go to Alaska and set a little booth up. My whole booth fit my suitcase and, and, uh, and we sold pocket knives. Then when we sold the Christmas ornaments, Janae and I loaded up our minivan and drove to LA and, uh, and set up a, a booth. And, and it does expose you to a lot of customers. But the other thing it also does is, I forget, I feel like Rick Perry. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the, the other thing it does is I believe that buyers are like hunters. Okay, this is important. Make a note of this. <laughs> this is the most profound thing I'll say. So buyers are like hunters. They really are. No one wants to be solicited to, especially if you're a buyer, because it's not very glamorous to go into your boss. Oh yeah, these guys sent me a catalog and look, I'm gonna order it. And so it's different. It's amazing how you'll send stuff and you'll give you'll you'll send emails and you'll send product and then they show up at your booth and they're like, they've never seen it before. And they're like, wow, look what I just found. You know, I'm going to take this back to headquarters and show what, what all this money of them flying me out here did. And I really believe that. It's the same way with, with, uh, with lots of sales. When someone's being sold to versus when they're in the buying mode of, hey, I'm going like a hunter to bring back a carcass of something. Sorry for all you people kind of that don't like carcasses. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not very politically correct. Have you sensed that? Um, but I really believe there's a different psychology. So being at the trade shows, they're really there knowing that, wow, my company sent me out here paying all this money. I've got to find something. And so it really is. Now, that's changed now because we've been there long enough. And it's interesting to give you guys an idea. When we first started, our booth cost maybe 12000 Yeah, maybe. This last year, our booth was feet by 20 feet and just the floor space, no fixtures, no electricity, was 65000 mm -hmm. for four days. That's some pretty expensive rent. That's just, yeah. We slept there and everything. We just stayed right now. Um, <laughs> but it, it's amazing. And now we're in the mode where we have to be there just to be a part of the game. We have to be there because you don't want people to go, hey, where'd iFrogs go? They were, you know. But you're not there on pins and needles waiting for the Walmart buyer because you already have relationships with them. In fact, most of them They'll say, well, we might swing by the booth and say hi, but they're out still looking for other new stuff. Because they'll call you and say, hey, come see us tomorrow and bring new stuff. And so it's different. We're probably way over. Right? Is that it? Thank you. <laughs>